for these really inspiring perspectives on behalf of uh, amazing student Thai, uh, Graciano and uh, myself and all the participants from around the world. We want to thank you for bringing these rich perspectives. And also, I know it's really late for all of you, but if you're up to staying up, we now are going to segue into another amazing dialogue with one of the top climate minds funders, thought leaders, catalysts uh, in the world, I like to say, uh, Tom Stiers. So, and I hope to make connections between all of us after this summit, but I welcome you to join us on the next dialogue. Anu, um, over to you to introduce the next dialogue. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Joe, Stephen, and Lauren for your amazing perspectives. And thank you to our moderators, Radhika and Ty, for such a wonderful panel. Our next dialogue is Tech Innovation and Youth Catalysts in combating climate change with Tom Steyer, moderated by the amazing Radhika Shah again. So please enjoy. Thank you, thank you, Anu. And um, actually we have improvised. So we, it, I just wanted to mention this dialogue will be moderated by myself and Lucas uh, Bosman. Lucas, are you here? Add yourself. Uh, we have to have the with a yes, dialogue with Tom. We cannot do it without a voice of youth. And when we have an amazing young person who's so passionate about climate change and a big fan of Tom, we have to have him here. So welcome. Welcome, Tom. We are so excited to have you here. I will just um, share a little bit of perspective for our audience and then over to you. Thank you again. And a lot of the dialogues in, uh, in the morning have led up to this. I think uh, climate change has come up so much, but intersectionality with the SDGs. Uh, so I am Radhika Shah, co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, uh, and my brilliant uh, co-moderator here, uh, Lucas, and I welcome all of you to this dialogue on tech innovation and youth, the catalyst in combating climate change with climate uh, thought leader, Tom Stiers. In this moment of great crisis, it is also a moment of great opportunity. We don't have much time left to combat this climate crisis. Nothing else will matter if we can't slow it down, stop and reverse climate change immediately. The COVID crisis has shown us how connected climate change is to public health, tracking inequality, and almost everything else that impacts us. The most socioeconomically disadvantaged are impacted the worst by climate change, as we heard from so many of our earlier speakers. It impacts women disproportionately, it impacts gender justice, impacts our young generation severely. To me, this is a moment to embrace the Gandhian philosophy of thinking of ourselves as custodians of nature, trustees of sorts, and not to think of nature, the environment, as a resource for us to exploit. And to me, the SDGs really enshrine these principles. Yet mindset shift is critical, but not enough. We need powerful transformation levers if we are to make rapid headway. We will hear today from a trailblazer who has been catalyzing the most cutting edge tech and energy innovation, as well as unleashing and catalyzing the power of young change makers to bring positive and change in our world, not just to combat climate change, but racial justice, reform the corporate sector, and many, many more things. Oh, welcome, Tom. Um, Tom, I will briefly introduce Tom. Tom is a catalytic thought leader, action leader, philanthropist, and environmentalist. Of course, he needs no introduction, but since we are people from around the world, I will do it anyway. Tom left a successful investing business to give his own money, time, and energy on a very successful business to fight for progressive causes. He has become one of the country's leading forces in registering more youth voters and voters of color fighting climate change, working for racial justice, helping source better life and secure better lives for all Americans. From founding voter mobilization organization, Next Gen America, to spearheading uh, initiatives for democracy, Tom has led a number of people first grassroots campaigns that have repeatedly defeated powerful special interests. Tom has mobilized grassroots efforts to beat big oil to win clean air laws, force big tobacco to pay its share of healthcare costs. He's not shy and afraid to challenge and put businesses' feet to fire and close a billion dollar corporate tax loophole to fund public schools. Most recently, Tom was a former Democratic presidential candidate and in 2020 served as co-chair for our California Governor Newsom's Business and Jobs Recovery Task Force. He co-chaired Vice President Biden's Climate Engagement Advisory Council to help mobilize, mobilize climate voters. 
Tom will continue his work to make sure Americans reap the benefits of climate action in a just and equitable way. Tom served on the board of trustees of Stanford University since this is a Stanford anchor event, I must mention that for 10 years. And he and his wife signed the giving pledge to donate half of the wealth to charity during the uh, lifetime. So I know some of you earlier challenged us that why is America not doing the right thing? Why is America not talking of sustainability? Well, we want you to now hear a voice from America who's doing everything right. And we are very proud to have Tom Stiles here. Tom, Tom over to you. Radhika, that's so nice. Thank you all for having me today. Um, this is an incredibly exciting moment in the process of combating climate change. And I'm especially glad that Stanford is using its powerful convening power to bring together, examine and empower global climate solutions and to do it in a just and equitable way. I'm very excited about that. I think it's really important. I'm sure everyone's talked about it, but the Biden administration released our updated nationally determined uh, contribution yesterday at a summit that the Biden administration called for countries around the world to talk about climate. That is the promise of how much we're gonna reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 as a nation, but it was also very much our ticket back to being a respected, credible, leading voice in the community of nations in terms of this global fight. And let's be clear, our success in combating climate change is gonna be critical for the health of the people of this country and people around the world. It's gonna be, credit, it's going to be critical to our prosperity and it's gonna be critical to our safety. And that goal that the Biden administration announced yesterday of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 is not a marginal change. That is a moonshot announcement. That is a disruptive change. Let me just put it in context to put, a, just to, so people can kind of wrap their minds around it. For us to reduce by 50 to 52% overall means that we'll have to reduce our electricity emissions by 80%. We'll have to have five times as many renewables on the grid as we have now. And in order to do that, the rate of change, because we've been putting renewables on the grid, will have to increase by two and a half times over the next nine years. And remember, when we're talking about renewables, when we're talking about the grid, solar, wind, we're talking about the utility industry. And the utility industry is a very slow moving, deliberate industry. To change the rate of change there by two and a half times is warp speed, and that's disruption. It means that in fact, all of society is going to have to work together to make this happen. It is gonna start with leadership from government. You know, our government has been absent from the international conversation on climate for four years. That's famous. We've been absent in terms of being part of the solution in every way. And the Biden administration has been changing that from day one. The government has a straightforward job in this. It's critical. Fund the research, set the rules, provide the incentives, and invest in the backbone. But that is just really setting the stage for what private industry and technology need to do. That is going to be the linchpin for both creating the kind of energy future, a clean energy future that we need, and also creating the kind of prosperity, this is going to be what drives our prosperity going forward as a country and as a world. We're and when I talk about prosperity, it's a very simple thing. This is how we're gonna create jobs. This is how we're gonna create jobs that you can live on well. This is a big part of having a just and equitable economy. And let me say this. The reason this is possible, we are at the turning point here. And the reason that's true is the political realities have changed and the economic realities have changed. It's not just, it is partly about the costs of clean energy versus dirty energy. But if you listen to what corporations are saying, and I'll just choose one, it's a complete change. JP Morgan traditionally has been the biggest funder of frontier oil and gas exploration in the whole world. 
the chairman of the executive committee of their board was the former CEO and chairman of the Exxon Corporation. About four months ago, JP Morgan said they were going to run their, their loan book according to the Paris Accords. A complete change. We need disruption. If you look at 2020, the biggest American car company, GM, produced 21,000 electric vehicles. A startup American company, Tesla, produced 500,000 electric vehicles, 25X. If you want to know, we need disruption, and it's very hard for legacy companies, for legacy systems to disrupt because the people who run them profit from the status quo. You know, you're asking them to disrupt the very thing that in effect they've built and which they depend on. So it's very hard. So when we look at what's gonna disrupt economically, I mean, I'm very happy to be at Stanford. Stanford traditionally has been about technology, innovation, disruption. What we need for disruption politically is also about Stanford, it's young people. Radhika mentioned, I started Next Gen America. It's the largest registration, empowerment, and turnout vehicle in the United States for young people. And the reason is young people aren't invested in the status quo. If this is gonna happen, the disruptive energy, the people who can see the most clearly are gonna be the young people of this country and the young people of this world. In order for us to get the change we need, you are going to have to demand it. And let me say, there is absolutely no way that Joe Biden would be president of the United States without a record turnout of young voters. Voters, The highest percentage of young voters voted in 2020 as since America allowed 18-year-olds to vote. Absolutely determinative. So I view this very simply. We're at the tipping point right now. We have the disruptive forces in place economically and politically to make it happen. They really are in some ways typified by this very gathering. But let me say this, if we don't disrupt and change dramatically the way we're generating and using energy, the backbone of our economy, the natural world will disrupt for us. If you look at where we are, I think too often people talk about climate in a very linear fashion, in the sense that we emit this much greenhouse gas and the result is this much heat increase. But actually we're very close to tipping points in terms of the, the tundra, we're very close in terms of the Amazon basin, we're very close in terms of the Gulf Stream. So if we don't disrupt the way we generate and use energy, the natural world will hit tipping points that will take it out of our hands and disrupt in a way that will make us all very, very sorry. That's why this is so key. That's why it's a huge opportunity in so many ways. And that's why it's such an emergency in so many ways. Thank you. Over to Tom. you, Radhika. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring words and the power of youth. And uh, again, thank you for reassuring our international participants that America is in a sense back in the game. We are a global citizen again. And I must say that I have to say that I'm also so proud of a new president and the bold actions is taking on so many fronts to advance the SDGs on climate change, on tackling inequality, tackling poverty in America. And these are not incremental at all. So, so you will see a very different America than you did in the last four years. So, uh, with that, uh, let's bring in the voice of youth. Uh, Lucas, uh, share some perspectives as, a, as a representing the youth um, of our nation, how you feel, and then over to you on um, the dialogue with Tom. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Radhika. Um, Tom, it's an honor for you to, for you to be here. Um, I would echo everything that you just said. Um, I think we have a duty to ensure that for both now and in the future, that people live a dignified life and climate and sustainability is central to that. Um, and the challenges are daunting, like Radhika said in the beginning, but our opportunities are greater. And it seems that hopefully we are uh, in a catalytic moment where we're going to see change in the next decade. Um, I think one of my questions for Tom would be, you, met, you touched on this briefly, but uh, the youth and those who will most face the challenges of climate change 
are at the moment outside of powerful decision-making institutions um, like politics or the private sector. Um, and because of this, we see protesting as the main source of youth engagement. Um, alongside voting for people who are obviously of age, how can the youth be involved in these institutions that are normally out of their reach? Lucas, I think that that is a critical question and you're absolutely right that in terms of representation in the halls of power, whichever halls you're talking about, young people are dramatically underrepresented. And it's very costly for our society in my mind because there is a lot of knowledge and wisdom in young people that is not distributed evenly among the population. And in particular, let me say, our young generation is the largest generation in American history. This I'm really talking about millennials and Gen Z. It's by far the most diverse in American history. It's also the most progressive in America, by far. So it is critical. That's why I started Next Gen to try and get the voice of your generation heard more. It does mean you know registering. It does mean volunteering. It does mean voting. And unfortunately, I think it does mean protesting. I think it does mean holding people to account. I believe that the Black Lives Matter movement and the reaction to the murder of George Floyd was absolutely critical in bringing attention and forcing people in those halls of power to pay attention to the deep racial injustice in this country. And I believe that that will be true about climate too, that the Sunrise Movement, that AOC, that young people in leadership positions need to be supported and other young people need to protest as the way of holding the people in elected office and the people running big companies to account. But let me say this too, I believe in the power of young people politically. I also believe in the power of young people economically. When I talk to people in the tech world, people who are starting companies, people who are following um, you know, new energy innovation, overwhelmingly young, passionate, really driven on it, really trying to integrate their personal and professional lives in a meaningful way, understanding the threat to their generation of climate change. And I try and align myself as much as possible with young people because I really believe that's where the intellectual ferment is. That's where the, you know, the, the passion is to drive of technological change that we desperately need. So I think it's gonna be a question of people in your generation really involving their whole lives in affecting the changes and really seeing their professional and personal lives very differently connected than in the old days where people you know, tended to separate them. I think that connecting those two is gonna be a critical part of young people really changing the way we react to climate, but the way we react to every part of our value-driven life. Absolutely. And I think, I think you touched on an interesting note there too, the economic part of young people's lives. And I think obviously financial uh, conditions play such an important role in people's ability to pay attention to, um, to the climate reality that's around us. If people are stressed about making it week to week, they're unable to focus on the bigger picture sometimes. Um, and so I guess uh, a follow-up question to that would kind of be, how do you think, um, or do you think it is possible rather to tackle climate change um, and the sustainability challenges that we face with so such economic inequality and um, is that even possible before we tackle you know, that? Lucas, I think that's a great and really important question. And let me say, it's not only possible, it's absolutely essential. So let me take you back a little. In 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, I was co-chairing a proposition to stop some oil companies from turning back the progressive energy laws in, the, in the, my home state of California. And people thought we were going to lose because it was going to be defined publicly as jobs versus the environment and people would always vote for jobs instead of the environment. It's absolutely critical more than a decade ago to recognize that in fact, who the true environmentalists in the state of California are, not the people that the press likes to tell you they are, which is white people with graduate degrees. That is the institutional environmental community, but the true environmentalists in our state 
and you can go check. And we knew this, and it's clear today as it was then. Start with Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans. The reason that probably Native Americans aren't included in those numbers is such a small percentage of the population. But in fact, when you want to deal with climate action, with policies, it's absolutely critical to have environmental justice. The fact that the, our society has concentrated toxins and pollution in underserved black and brown communities all across this country for as long as anyone can remember. And that those people absolutely are in this fight in a very personal way and need to lead. So that when, when you ask, is it possible to have this be part that the environmental change necessary, the climate action necessary to be part of the movement for economic, racial, and environmental justice, to have those be the same thing. I would say it's not only possible, it cannot happen unless you do that. You will not get the right policies unless there's leadership from those communities. And let me say that in California, which is traditionally had the most progressive energy laws in the United States, when we reauthorized our cap and trade, our in effect carbon tax system in 2017, it was leadership in the legislature from the absolute poorest districts in this state that made it happen. It has to happen, it will happen. There is uh, there are some questions coming in and uh, one of them is from Maria Lichenstern on Tom. She's asking about, um, we need to get policy to the people we are not given enough civic education in public schools. How do people understand advocacy, lobbying, difference between regulation, legislation, how to work with representatives, um, any perspectives on this? Of course she's right. Of course Maria is right that you know we have a huge issue in the United States about being educated enough to be really fully informed and responsible citizens. And let me say this, I'm a huge believer in uh, the internet that the, you know, we have new ways of communicating with people. I mean, I was just listening to people talk about tele-education, tele-health. There is, you know, I think telepolitics. that in fact, we have an ability to educate each other, teach each other via the internet, which is, I, I think, incredibly powerful and really is my belief that it, we can use this in, in terms of engaging and, you know, empowering people across the spectrum of America and really bringing people up to speed. It's good. It's not trivial. It's, you know, it's work, but really NextGen does an enormous amount of that, of trying to reach people where they are. People 18 to 35 are very often on their computers or phones. Yeah. There's another question uh, uh, from Peter uh, Gitinji, I think from uh, Kenya. Uh, what role do you think green financing will play in regard to climate action? So of course, that's a critical question too, as we look forward between now and 2050 and trying to move to net zero carbon emissions as a globe. And obviously there's gonna be a lot of development throughout the world. And it's gonna be, I think there are a couple of things about green finance. First of all, it's gonna be cheaper to build solar and wind. They've already come down 90%. They're gonna keep going down. The capability and cost per kilowatt hour of batteries is also going to become incredibly more powerful. So when I think about green finance, I don't believe that we're going to be financing things that are more expensive or less efficient or you know where there's some premium to clean. I believe that human ingenuity will beat burning rocks. And that in fact, it, we have to make sure as that the financial systems of this globe support clean investment around the world. And I don't believe it's gonna, I think that has to happen. I think it will happen based on the costs and those the costs don't even include all of the environmental and climate costs of fossil fuel development. Thank you, Tom. There's another question from anonymous attendee. Uh, for those of us interested in entrepreneurship, what role do you believe the private sector and tech innovation will play in addressing climate change? And to that, I will add on also one of my own questions um, that uh, again, from them, the tech side, that as we are being rapidly accelerated into tech adoption, even faster than we intended to via COVID, um, how do you see that impacting climate change? Will it help or are there, are there also challenges will create this extreme rapid uh, leapfrogging into uh, tech adoption? Well, first of all, I think 
we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't have the capability really of addressing this if it weren't for the tech that's gone over, on over the last 20 years. There's no, I, I referenced the fact that solar and wind have come down by 90%. On a cost per kilowatt hour, they're cheaper than fossil fuels in many places, most places in the world, and they'll be cheaper than every place. So it's absolutely critical that that tech happen, including you know, new ways of storage, but also we're just talking about electricity generation here. We're not even talking about you know, electric vehicles and all the uh, technological advances there. We're not talking about regenerative ag. We're not talking about the new kinds, exciting kinds of manufacturing or what we can do in the built environment, in buildings, heating and cooling. So technology is absolutely critical for this to happen. It's going to be very exciting. I think the way to think about this simply is the government sets up the rules, they provide the infrastructure, and within that box, the private sector, the entrepreneurs, the researchers, the, the you know, corporate leaders make it happen. So it's set up the rules and execute, and it's private, the private industry that will execute and make this actually happen in the real world. Thank you, Asher. Framing it that way, that's very powerful to think of it visually as a framework. Uh, Lucas, back to you, voice of youth. Yeah, I think there's an interesting question in the Q&A chat that I thought was uh, really relevant. Um, they asked, or they said, it seems like there's a lot of commercials that put the burden of climate change on consumer decisions um, and not on production methods or transnational corporations. Um, they ask, are consumers really at fault? Absolutely not. I think that's a great question, Lucas. I really appreciate that because we are not going to solve this problem by consumers doing the research to figure out, for instance, where their electricity is coming from. You know, it, I, I think that's absolutely unfair. The rules of the road have to be set by the United, you know, the governments of the world and the, you know, that determine how corporations, you know, build, produce, and, um, run things. So I, I, you know, do I think that consumer behavior matters? Yeah, I think we should all be responsible human beings, but society sets up rules for society. We have a democracy so that the elected representatives will say, we are now gonna start charging people for polluting. We didn't used to do that, obviously. We need to do that. That are gonna say, you can't, you know, basically you're, your garbage company cannot basically take garbage from here and put it in your neighbor's yard and then charge somebody for it because it's, you know, now it's in your neighbor's yard. We need governments to set the rules. And that's exactly what's always happened in the history of the United States. When we need to make a huge change, the government says it. If you look at what happened in World War II, the government said, we're not building any passenger cars or trucks, period. We're building tanks and planes and ships, period for as long as it takes. If we, want, if we really want as a society to get something done, we have to be all in together, not count on people doing the right thing. People will do the right thing, people care about this, but that's not gonna be nearly enough and they can't be expected to do the hard research to figure out exactly you know, which company is growing you know, the kind of agriculture that sequesters carbon and the company that's you know, growing plants that emit carbon. We just can't be expected to do that. It's got to come from a central place. Thank you. Thank you Tom. so much. Lucas. Uh, I was just saying, thank you so much. Um, I think that's about all from me, but I can hand it back over to Radhika for closing thoughts and any statements. Thank you so much, Tom, for uh, being here. Lucas, it's a pleasure. And I very, I'm not kidding. Your generation, I have four kids who are 27, 29, 31 and about to be 33. I am so impressed by the commitment of your generation that I see through them and their friends, the people I meet through next gen, my awareness of how that your generation really is going to drive things numerically and politically and from an economic basis. And that is really my hope that around the world, that energy and the connection of what this means for you personally is going to mean this is going to happen and in a real time in a way that saves us all. Thank you, Tom. I also want to mention that Lucas and Anu, who's uh, our MC, and Samuel and Ty and Dan and Nick and all the amazing Kylie, um, the, the Stanford Basis team, their energy has been amazing in pulling the summit together. And you guys are the catalyst of change. And I would say that in my world of Silicon Valley, I have trouble engaging my community, alumna, 
to talk about the SDGs, which are our progressive causes, but these kids just jumped in and the change comes from the young people. Uh, and thank you for that. And thank you, Tom. One final question, um, a quick response on that would be interesting. Um, let's come in uh, around, uh, how, do you, how do we reimagine higher education and the need to restructure it for climate change? Well, let me say that, you know, I was on the board of Stanford for 10 years. Um, and I've had it, that was really my best chance to think about higher ed. I am a huge believer that we can have education that takes advantage of online capability. And, you know, how exactly we do that is going to be, is still a little bit to be determined. But when you see what Arizona State University is doing, when you see what some people are doing to reach out, when you see what the community colleges of California, which reach 2.2 million kids every year are in the community colleges of California. We know that there's an, a capability and an obligation to include many, many, many more people in the possibility and the advantages of higher ed. And so I am really enthusiastic. I mean, this is an information-based system by definition, right? And so the kinds of things that you see in Khan Academy, the kinds of things that are happening in terms of interactive learning online, is something that has to be part of the future and has to be more inclusive, more democratic, and I think it's going to be more effective. And so I'm very, you know, this is a revolution that is at its very nascent stages. I think that COVID did kind of force us to, to recognize that this has to happen. We have to accept it. And it's going to be, you know, I'm very optimistic about what that's going to lead to in terms of the democratization of education and a greater chance for people here and around the world to really participate in sort of their own lives and living up to their own potentials. Thank you again, Tom, for that inspiring, um, optimistic, and uh, really, really catalytic uh, perspective. Um, we, again, thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you for energizing all the young people from around the world, not just in America. Very thank you, Radhika. Leadership, yeah. Anu, over to you. Yes, thank you so much again, Tom Steyer and our moderators, Radhika and Lucas, for such a wonderful panel.